Hallelujah. Okay, the children quietly dismissed. Hello. I think you can open your Bibles and Hello. open Jonah. Say peace. But before we look at Jonah, we're going to read one scripture on the screen. First John 5, 4. We may end up having that movie to read on Wednesday night. We all know each other. <laughs> I'm, we're not complaining, though, are we? Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> Before we read in the book of Jonah, now you know you always go to Jonah to look at Jonah, right? But tonight, instead of going to Jonah to look at Jonah, we're going to look at Nineveh. We're going to look about how do you know if somebody's in faith? Or next few uh, Wednesday nights, we're going to talk about faith because. Faith is one of those things, you can study it and get a real grip on it, be walking by it, and still get back into unbelief because we, we live in such a negative world that if you're not proactive about faith, you can get in unbelief, okay? So to start out here, let's look at 1 John 5, 4. Read it with me. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Now, has anybody had a battle with the world this week? Okay. Who's the God of this world? So who are we fighting when we fight the world? What is the victory that overcomes the world? Our faith. And who or what overcomes the world? Anybody born of God? Whatever's born of God. How many have been born of God? So we're supposed to be world overcomers every day that we live. Praise the Lord. Now, we should get very excited about faith because this says it's our key to victory. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. But a lot of born-again Christians or children of God are not excited about faith because they think faith is a mystery and hard to understand. Now, faith is mysterious in the sense that it is in the spiritual realm, but faith is not a mystery. Once you begin to study faith in the spiritual realm, you will find that faith operates on spiritual laws precisely as airplanes overcome gravity by physical laws. You've got to understand when Wilbur and Orville got out there in Kitty Hawk and they flew for however many seconds that was, that was a mystery to a lot of people. Right. It was like they almost thought it was supernatural. Men can't fly. Right. But the reason is when you study um, natural laws, gravity always works. You, you hold a ball out here, you can release a ball 515 times, and 515 times it will go down and not up. We call that a law, right? Gravity. Faith is a spiritual law. Faith is a force. And we're going to talk for a little while tonight about the fact that you can tell what somebody believes by what they're saying and what they're doing. Now, that doesn't mean we're all supposed to go around judging each other. We're supposed to, I, I noticed I got out of faith in something, and I thought I was in faith on it. And as soon as I started looking at myself, I thought, oh, <laughs> you're an unbelief. Guess what? And you say, well, why do we have to do this? Because God has wider and broader horizons for you. Okay? Amen. So say this with me. You can always tell oh, yes. what somebody's believing oh, by what they're doing and what they're saying. Now, tonight we're going to look at Jonah for a minute. And you have to realize the people of, of Nineveh were dreadfully wicked. And yet, because they heard the word of Jonah that they were in danger, they believed, they repented, and were spared. Jesus said, the men in Jonah's generation will rise up and condemn the generation he, he ministered to because they actually were bright enough to repair. Just as a little side thought, how many of you remembered when we did three Sundays on King Hezekiah? Uh -huh. Remember? Yeah. Do you remember how they sat on the wall and screamed at him and said, you're going to drink your own urine and eat your own dung? Remember how wicked those, it was the Assyrian king, right? Well, just as a little aside, look at, you don't have to turn there, but look at 2 Kings 19. This is the story of King Hezekiah. It says, when it happened that night, the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when Men arose early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead. Now look where the king of Assyria lives. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the worst dude that has ever lived. Pretty close. I mean, he's like Hitler. Yeah. He trained his soldiers to go in and terrorize the towns by splitting open pregnant women and revealing the fetuses. And you've got to be pretty wicked and pretty cruel. That's what they were known for. They terror. I mean, they were the first ISIS. They, they used terror as a weapon. 
So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived in Nineveh. So we're talking at Nineveh, some of the cruelest people on the yeah. face of the earth. And let's look at Jonah 1, 1 to 3. You probably remember part of this, but it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, Joppa found a ship, which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Has anybody ever tried to hide from God? We all have. How well does that work? No. So, from these three verses, I ask you the questions, did God want Nineveh warned? Yes. Did Jonah want to warn them? No. no. So, you know the story, the big storm comes, they throw him overboard. Go to chapter 3. The, the great fish finally vomits him up on the beach. And in Jonah 3, verse 1, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. That means it took three days to walk around the perimeter. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, my question is, how are you and I going to know as we continue to read if the people believe? If they don't believe, they'll laugh at him to scorn and mock and go on their merry way. I'm making a really basic point right now, and this point of the sermon is that you can always tell what somebody's believing by what they say and what they do. Let's keep reading verse 5. Then the people of Nineveh believed God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And when the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on ashes. He issued a proclamation, and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the kings and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste to think. That means your dog couldn't get a drink of water for three days. We, we don't have cattle, so we don't hardly even relate to them. Your cows couldn't drink and your sheep couldn't drink. Nobody's going to eat a bite or drink anything. We're going to fast and seek God. Do not let them eat or drink water. Both men and beasts must be covered with sackcloth. And let men call on God earnestly, that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented. Don't you love God? Isn't he Amen. merciful? Yeah. He relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Now, how do we know that they believed? We know they believed because they called a fast. They repented. They said, we, well, let's seek God earnestly. It's obvious, right? Now listen to this statement. It is no mystery what you're believing tonight. Your trust in God or lack thereof is evident. Now listen, I'm preaching to me. This is what got to me this morning. All of a sudden I realized I needed to go back over the faith basics and be sure that I was, it's real easy to start coasting. The moment you start coasting, you start going downhill in, with the world, okay? And you need to, okay. It's no mystery what you're believing tonight. Your trust in God or lack thereof is evident. Now, it, this is solemn, and I understand that, but it's real easy to change. The same you that got into unbelief can get back in faith. Yeah. Yeah. You need to be in faith for your kids, and faith for your future, and faith for your home. And yeah. There is not any area of your life where you don't need to be using your faith. Yeah. The good news is we can do it. Hallelujah. What you believe will ultimately determine what you're doing and saying, and it will ultimately determine where you end up in life. Your faith is the producer of every good thing in your life. Your relationships are affected by faith. You, yeah. Hey, you're saved because you believed. You got, if you've got saved family, it's because you used your faith. How many of you prayed your kids into the kingdom of God, even if they're little right now? Hallelujah. Your Father God is a faith God, and you were made in his image. Look at Psalm 146, just two verses here. You can turn there if you want to. We're done in Jonah, I think. But our Father lives and reigns by faith. 
It says, how blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, look at this, who keeps faith forever. It can also be translated, I believe, keeps covenant forever. But our Father lives by faith, he created the world by faith, and he rules forever by faith. And I, for one, am extremely glad. Aren't you glad? Yeah. I wouldn't want him to get it in fear and let the devil take over. Thank God. Now, let's take a promise. Turn to Matthew 6, 25 to 26. Jesus gave us constant promises as he was here. Did you know there are enough promises that we could absolutely squish worry out of our lives? Do you know you're either thinking faith thoughts or worry thoughts just about every moment you're awake? Everybody say, this is good. For I have an opportunity. God doesn't want you just, he, he doesn't want you to plateau. He wants me to be grateful for every single thing your faith has gotten this and to be always knowing exactly what you're believing for. I have heard Jesse Duplantis um, preaching this sermon, don't live in cruise control. Because you can get sort of just completely unaware of what's going on. Now look at what Jesus said here in Matthew 6, 25. He says, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they don't sow or reap or gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they not worth much more than they? So has the Father promised to provide our needs? Yes, yes it's absolutely a given. And then look at verse 34. Verse 34 says, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Well, that is a big, big thing. That means if you're going to be concerned about anything, be concerned about this day. Don't worry about tomorrow. Every day's got enough trouble, it says. Now, the truth is, this is not new to you, what we're talking about tonight. I understand that. It's not new to me. And yet, after 30-some years of being filled with the Spirit, walking by faith most of that time, I still have to go back over and just check the basics, because I find, okay, hallelujah. Now, Mark 11, 23 is the greatest faith scripture, and Jesus is the one who said it, so you can't really argue with it. Okay, some people think Kevin Hagan wrote it, but he didn't. Okay? Read, what, read with me what Jesus said when they said, how did you curse that fig tree? Read this with me. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted to him. Now the Lord spoke something to Mark Hankins about this verse, and he said if I had added just two words to that verse, every Christian would have been a faith giant. And Mark said, well, what in the world do you mean? He said if I had just said, Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, oh, that, but believes that what he says in church is going to happen, it will be granted. Now, now and we all say ouch. We all say ouch. Because we all have faith battles. I don't know, maybe it's because of some of the greatest faith battles you will ever fight are for your home and your kids. Now, you kids, I'm sure, think you're fighting faith battles for your parents. Right. But <laughs> we got to, I tell you right now, somebody prayed my future through. Yeah. I'll just be honest with you. If I had been on my own, even my mom and dad, I, they loved me and I loved them and they were Christians, but they were super involved in career. My dad was president of a university. It was extremely demanding and it demanded a lot of time. And I just about floundered and just fell away. If you know how a way is, a way away. I had a grandmother who would not let me go. Saw the call of God in my life and decided that she would pay any price necessary in prayer to get me through. Now, I'm not trying to threaten. I'm just saying as far as I know, we pray our kids through to where they need yes. to be. Your kids should be... Okay. Like that. Hallelujah. The Lord has given us a way to get the answers to prayer from heaven to earth. And the ladder he uses is faith. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Bill Winston. Anybody? He is a preacher in Chicago, marvelous preacher. 
And he used this illustration, and it really helped me. And it's simple as can be, and it, 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 maybe it'll help you. Okay. We are right here, right now, very aware of the physical realm. Okay. We also know that there is a realm where the answers are. Do you remember Jacob's um, dream? Right as he was fleeing from Esau, he went to bed one night, slept right out in the middle of nowhere, and had a dream of a ladder extending into heaven with angels up and down. Well, where were those angels going? They were going to the other realm. There is another realm. Amen. That realm is accessible to us through our faith and through our prayers. And what he says is this. There is like a veil. We know that. And we're down here in this realm. And the answers are up in this realm. And the question is how to get what you need. It could be money, but I, I tell you, I think money's one of the easier things to get. Unless you're squandering it. I mean, money is not a big deal. I'll tell you what you need. You, you need help for those that you love. You need vision for your future. You, okay? you need faith itself sometimes. What you need from this realm is faith. Okay. Now, what he said was, uh, let's take a scripture, and I thought this was the best. I'd ever understood the scripture. Ephesians 1, 3 says he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Read this with me. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. You know what that means? Everything you need, he said yes. Yeah. He's already said in 3 John 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that you be in health, prosper and be in health. Do you know what kind of year God wants 2016 to be for you? I can promise you this on the basis of his word. He wants it to be a year full of health and full of prosperity. That's 3 John 2. Amen. So if he's already said yes to your health and yes to your prosperity, what is our job? Our job is agreement with what our Father has already spoken. And you can say, well, I don't want to have to live by faith. I cannot pretend to explain to you why God is a faith God. We were, I was born into this, were you? I'm not complaining. I like the way he runs the universe. And I like the way he runs my life when I get it. But whether you think you like living by faith or not, it is not optional. You can say, I don't believe Jesus died for my sins, and you will go to hell. You got into heaven by faith. You are justified by faith. Four times in the scriptures it says the just live by faith. And we, we get up in the morning and breathe by faith. Yeah. You've got an insurance problem, you use your faith on that insurance. Our insurance problems like some of the worst. Okay. Use your faith on an insurance problem. You've got a career problem, you use your faith. Yeah. Your kids need help, you use your faith. This is it. So here's what he said. Bill Winston said this, everybody understands that we're down here, and everybody understands that the realm up here is every bit as real, but it's more real than the realm in which we live. Right. Which is the parent realm? The, spirit. the spiritual realm. That's right. It was our, this realm was created out of the spiritual realm. What your faith does is it takes the truth of God's promise, and it superimposes it on the, the fact of this world. Now, the fact is you may have a problem with your arm, maybe a bad infection, let's say. We're not saying you don't have an infection in your arm. We're just saying that the word of the living God says that Jesus Christ paid for your healing by his stripes. You were healed. And your faith draws it down into it and applies it and makes it real. Our job is to kind of, the, the, it's wonderful if you have a happy marriage, both of you being, you know, uh, Christians. If you are humble enough to say, honey, correct me. We really, that was hard. I remember. <laughs> but you know, I finally got to a place where I had to let Nathan correct me. I'm glad he's not here. He's saying that. When Nathan chilled, it's really hard. You don't think you're proud until your five-year-old says something that's true and you're wrong. And then you realize, I'm the parent. You're correcting me and you're right. But you see, faith is very easy for children. Now, you know why? There is nothing complicated about faith. You just believe it. It's like I've said before, if you tell a kid, Jesus wants you baptized, he says, is it today? Do I need a towel? Do I have to ask my mom? You, you never have to convince a child to get baptized. Go teach a children's class. You just tell them, do you love Jesus? Jesus said, if you love him, you should get baptized. A hundred percent of them say, sure, when? Does it have to get any warmer? And they don't care. They just take what he says. And so when you said, you tell them, and you know, you know it's true. 
by his stripes, when he took that horrible, horrible, horrible um, beating and, and um, scourging, you were healed. Don't lay hands on you and get you healed even if your head's messing with you and you don't think you can get healed. Your yeah. kids will get you healed because it's so simple. Yeah. But as simple as faith is, I'll say this again, the Lord has already said yes to everything we need. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. It is still incumbent upon us. Now, I know people who, who do really well tithing for a while and then they don't. Now, I'll tell you why this is. Oh, I should bring that word up. You need a quote word for tithing to understand. I, I want to explain this. When you first are saved and you need healed, you can just, I remember when I first came back to God, I got filled with the Spirit. I had my like, wisdom teeth up within of two weeks, three weeks. And I just said, oh, Lord, I don't want to hurt. And I don't want swelling. So I went and got my wisdom teeth out. I had zero swelling. You couldn't tell I had my wisdom teeth out. I took one Tylenol once because I'm not bragging. I'm telling you, this is how it is for every baby Christian. God's so excited. And he, he just says, oh, come on, little toddler. And he just takes care of you. And then when you start tithing, he wants you to encourage it. He blesses the socks yeah. off you and you do better. And then on one day, it doesn't look like it's working. <laughs> how many people have ever been a faithful tither? And at that moment, it didn't look... How many of you have ever stuck with it and overcame it? It always works. But the devil is out to tell you it will not work. Okay? Now, how do we get to this? Oh. Here we have... I don't want to my little... If this is the two realms, as you grow up, God, the Father, expects you to use your faith routinely to pull in all you need, and then to use your faith for somebody else. Yeah. And he will allow your faith muscles to get tested a little bit where you have to do a few push-ups and get a little stronger. Yeah. Our answers to prayer are just out of view in the spiritual realm. Your faith is what accesses provision that's been made for you in the spiritual and visible realm. But you, if you, you say, why do I have to use my faith? Why can't daddy just dump it on me? He does Later, he wants you to grow into the fullness of the stature of the man Christ Jesus. If you don't learn how to use your faith and stand in faith for yourself, you won't be able to go pray for the sinner and say, here, God wants to heal you and see miracles. Yeah. God, yeah. hallelujah. Yeah. Philippians 4.19. This is another where it talks about the blessings we have above. Read it with me. <laughs> and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So if here, I like these other papers, but there they are. Okay. So here, we're down here. And some of us, we need a blessing from up above. All right? How does he, how does he supply our needs? He supplies it according to his riches. And you sometimes, if you truly have, a, you ought to have something you're believing for financially. Okay? One of the best ways is to make a formal written request, okay? Maybe it's to pay off your house, whatever. Write it down, husband and wife, and say, Lord, we would like to be debt free. We are willing to cooperate. You see, you say, well, don't tell me anything about tithing. I don't know how to explain it otherwise. I don't know how to explain it. I would have zero, I mean, as in zero, made for my finances with what I know. Now, if you're totally ignorant and a baby, God's so good to you. You know. But I knew about tithing when I was five years old. Right. They gave me a dime. This was many years ago. Do you know how many years ago? You don't want to know many years ago. A dime was a dime back then, all right? All right. You, you take five dimes right now to buy a postage stamp. And back then, it was by bought several postage stamps. But anyhow, I, I knew that one penny of that belonged to God. You said, you, do you resent it? No. I was grateful. I figured if he got the first one, I got to keep nine. That's a pretty good deal. Yeah. So I wanted to give two just to tell. And it was just out of love. I, I remember that I was in a revival service. I'd just gotten saved. And I, I gave two pennies. My mom got mad. I remember that. She, she didn't know about sewing or anything. Well, she wasn't her fault. She thought, you just threw a penny away. <gasps> a penny's a penny. What is that then? You don't pick them up then. now, but you did then. You buy, you buy something with it. You'll get some candy with a penny. Sounds like the 1800s, doesn't it? This is bad. <laughs> <laughs> the dollar's gone fast. So what was I talking about? Okay. I per this is my personal belief. 
if you're going to prosper financially, you should cooperate with the system. Amen. And the way God has ordained for his kingdom on earth to be um, blessed and financed is through the tithe yeah. and offerings. And you say, but I don't like to tithe. That's between you and God. What you're saying when you say, I don't like to tithe, is I do not believe he will open the heavens and pour out a blessing until there's no more need. And Malachi 3 says it does. And now if you ask me, have I ever been in a place where it looked like I was giving and giving and giving, and I was out giving God? Absolutely. But I've never stayed there. Yeah. Now this is, this is where the rubber meets the road. What do you believe? If you really want to prosper financially in the kingdom of God, you have to believe that they, there is no way he would ever lie to you. Jesus is the one. We think faith preachers say, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, press down, shake it together, and running over. We used to have mem motions to that verse. It's really cool. Give, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, press down, shaken together, and running over. Can you see it? Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm starting to experience it. But my goodness, there were times when I gave because I believed. I gave because I loved. But let's suppose, let's suppose you say, okay, I'm willing to cooperate with the plan. I mean, personally, I can't imagine not because that's what the word says, okay? You go before God and say, God, we're tithers, we give offerings, and we want to live debt free. Amen. We want to pay our home off. The first thing I would do on something big like that, like I told you, when Christiana, they told us she was down, the first thing we did was take our faith and write a covenant contract with God. We wrote it down. And I, and I wrote it out, and Gordon signed it, and then I signed it. And that, that contract reminded God of his covenant. And it says, you count every star. It says so. We wrote it down the verse. You count the hairs on my head. If I go to bed with fewer hairs tonight than I got up this morning, you know exactly how many I lost. We believe, on the basis of this covenant, that if you can count all the stars, and you can count the hairs on our head, that you can count our baby's chromosomes correctly. We believe that, and we thank you for it. And we hold it to them. And we signed it. And we kept it. And when she was born, the, the doctor, she was a little Christian Catholic lady from the Philippines. She was squealing. She kept saying, oh, she's beautiful, she's beautiful, she's beautiful. Because she knew that I, I would stand in faith. Amen. Now, faith is the way you live. But you can get miracle after miracle after miracle in faith. And if you ever decide to just kind of... Take it easy and get pushed back into the world and listen to a lot of Fox and a lot of... I listen to Fox's skin then, but I can't listen to too much of it or I can find my faith. I, you know, I mean, it isn't just my faith I find going backwards. I find my love going backwards. Yeah. And I'm not blaming them. They don't know about love. So this realm does not have any idea the massive heart of God. And if you're going to stay in the place where you can get victory, you're going to have to expose yourself in this word and from faith preachers. Now, I better one here anyhow. I listen to a lot of teaching for a couple reasons. Part of it is I'm not going to keep fresh with you if I don't, if I'm not. You know, I can get stale and blah. I listen to faith, but mainly it's selfish. <laughs> He said, oh, it's selfish. No, it's not selfish. The lost, we saw Sunday morning, the lost need you to know who you are. They need you. And they need you not to be sick in bed. And they need you to have enough gas to go across town and pick them up for church. And they, they need you to prosper. They need you to show them the heart of God. Amen. But I can't do that myself unless I stay pretty up to date in this word. And I'm open to you. Okay. Yeah. Hallelujah. How can you know? Let's go, I know we read for John 2 or we quoted it, but let's just look. There's so many promises that, but you see, it's, it's one thing for your head to say, oh yes, I know that, that's not the issue. We're not talking about this tonight. Are you believing that? Are you, I went through a battle about four years ago and I shouldn't even, I didn't even talk about it because I don't want anybody to, but I was not from remembering scriptures and I was forgetting things. And the devil said, well, you're just like your grandmother who loved you so much and prayed you through. She went into Alzheimer's. You know, it's genetic. And you know, y'all would think I'm about ready to peel, don't you? No. <laughs> I had a choice. Yeah. I had a choice that said, oh, yeah, it's about the time for early onset. Or I had said, devil, 
you're a liar and you're the father of lies. I'm sure that I have the mind of Christ up oh, here yeah. above. And I'm going to start believing that the mind of Christ that Paul said we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I think it's verse 30, he said, we have the mind of Christ. If I need it, I have it. And I will pastor the church until the Lord doesn't need me. Amen. And I had to say it. Yeah. And I had to say it. And, I, and when, when you really know that you're in faith, as you, you can tell somebody that's really in faith they're happy. Yeah. Yeah. They have peace. Mm -hmm. They can't prove it to you, but they know they got it. Yeah. Third John 2. Read it with the Holy Spirit said this through John. Read it. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health as your soul prospers. If you need healing, are you fighting God for your healing? No. His whole will is for you to prosper, yeah. be in good health in 2016. Amen. Now, like I say, if you accept that, what do you do and say? He wants me healed. I just, like, I'm divided my body sometimes, but I always tell them, the Lord wants me healed more than I want me healed, and I need to be healed, and you will take the stupid whatever it is and get off my body. Amen. This promise is the end to worry and fear about our mental condition. If you're worried about your mind, and, and I've had other pe you know, some people say, well, I don't feel like I remember. A gentleman said, I don't feel like I remember scriptures the way I used to. Then you go and you say, he, he wants us to prosper because the, the health is our soul prospers. Your soul is your mind, will, and your emotions. He wants your emotions. Hey, you know, emo life is drought to have emotions. Yeah. But he doesn't want our emotions like this. Yeah. I think there's always a little bit, or we wouldn't know the highest when they came. But if your low emotions just totally bottom out on you, that says right there, God wants you to have joy. Yeah. This is the end of fear about our physical condition or our financial condition. If we believe just this one word, and we have hundreds of promises, worry will be replaced by gratitude, Amen. blessing, and praise. Now, this is so simple. Anybody can do it, but not everybody will. Part of this is because you have to humble yourself like a little child, as we already said, to walk by faith. You have to say, well, I believe it. And people say, well, can't you see, blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean... Look at what Habakkuk 2 4 says. First time faith is mentioned in the Bible. We only have like three minutes, two minutes. Read it with me. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by faith. So, do proud people live by faith? No. Because no. it really hurts your pride when you say, Well, I really believe I'm healed, and you look sick as a dog. Yeah? That hurts your pride. But you, children walk by faith. If, if you look at Isaiah 35, and I know I go to this scripture a lot, but it's just because this scripture has boggled my mind. The last three verses of Isaiah, it's where he talks about the way to Zion. Look, it says a highway will be there, a roadway. Is this the way of faith? Yes, how we walk by faith. It will be called the highway of holiness. You've got to live right to walk by faith. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way, and fools will not wander on it. I'd like to read that last ver that last line in um, all these other two other translations, New King James and, Hol and Holman Christian Standard. Can we go back to, yeah. A highway will be there. Look at the end. Whoever walks the road, although a fool shall not go straight. You do not have to go to Harvard or MIT to walk by faith. Yeah. You just have to believe the word of God. Yes. And you have to be humble enough to believe it. And you have to be willing to let people laugh at you if you want to laugh. I just really believe every promise is in there. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. And the last ver uh, version was um, Holman Christian Standard. It says, even the fool, at the end it says, even the fool will not go astray. We can't go there. Hebrews 1.11 says that faith gives assurance, conviction, substance, and evidence, and reality and proof to what's seen. If faith takes what's right there and just brings it right into your life. But you have to believe it and rejoice in it before you see it. It says, now faith is. I, I'm gonna, we're going to... I like this one last point, and then we're going to be able to are gonna pray. When you know you have something by faith, you can get just as happy as after everybody else sees it. And I'm just saying when you know you got it. Hallelujah. Yeah. Let, this is the example. I'm planning a great vacation with people you love can be almost as fun as the vacation itself. 
because of the reality and the anticipation of it. There's joy just in getting ready to go. Have you seen that? Yeah. Because you believe you are going. Romans 5, 15, 13. I'm going to read that and I'm going to quit. Yeah, everybody understand faith is doable. But you're not going to go, you're not going to live by faith unless you decide, I'm going to learn what Jesus said and agree with it, and, it, and I'm going to do the pressing it takes to constantly grow in faith. Does that make sense? Look at this. It says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Roman, or Hebrews 11, 1, if we had time to go there, says, now faith is a substance of things hoped for and the convictions of things not seen. What faith does is it takes your dreams and it brings them into reality. Yeah. And then you go back to Romans 4, 15, 13. My question I was going to ask you was, how much hope are you supposed to have? Look at the end, so that you may abound in hope. You're supposed to dream. Yeah. You're supposed to say, what would, what would I ask for if I knew I couldn't get enough? This in line with his work. Are you seeing? Yeah. We're supposed to be dreamers. We're supposed to have hope. And we're supposed to know how to use our faith to bring that hope into reality. We're going to keep studying it. But if nothing else you learned, you want to know what you're believing, you get a selfie stick and a video camera for the next 24 hours. Just tape you. Yeah. And then lay it back. And I promise you, you will find out exactly what you're believing. Okay? <laughs>